Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 19 through 22. I'm actually going to read it from the message. And, and this, this passage in Scripture is one of my favorite passages because it's so encouraging to know that God wants to use me. God wants to use us in what he is doing. This is what it says, starting at verse 19. It says, that's plain enough, isn't it? You are no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You are no longer strangers or outsiders, but you belong here. Everybody say, you belong here. Say, I belong here. It says, you belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a house. Everybody say, God's building a house. And he's using us all. Say, he's using me. So God's building a house, and he's using us all, irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you. He's using you. He's using me. He's using all of us, fitting us in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. That just fires me up to know that God is doing something and he chooses to use us. Like, like the creator of the universe makes the choice to do something and to build something, and he invites us, all of us, to be a part of what he is doing. Now, before I go any further, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. Uh, I'm going to do two things today, and that is, number one, I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach God's word. And secondly, I'm going to sweat, all right? So I got my sweat towel here, so, so I'm okay. I just get excited. My adrenaline gets going, and, um, and, and it's all good. So don't think I'm having a medical emergency or anything. I'm just happy to be here. So this message today is going to be pretty strong. It's going to encourage you. It's going to coach you up. And it's go I'm going to do it in a life-giving way to let you know that God's plan for your life, God's plan for my life, is better than our plan for our own lives. Like God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life. God's plan, and I've seen this true time after time again, I never thought that I'd be working with athletes in a, in a chaplain kind of position. Never thought I would do that. That wasn't the plan that I had for my life, but God had a plan for my life. So God's plan for my life is always going to be better than my plan for my life. And I can walk in the understanding of knowing that God always wants something for me and that God doesn't need anything from me. God doesn't want anything from me, but God wants something for me. That if God asks something of me, it's always so that he can give me something better. If God's asked something of you, it's always so that, he, so that you can make room to receive the better thing that he has for you. If God is asking for your heart, then it's because he wants to take your heart of stone and give you a softened heart of flesh. If God is asking for your life, it's so that he can give you life more abundantly. God always wants something for us. He doesn't want anything from us. And what he asks of us is so that he can get something better to us. Amen? God's plan for my life is better than my plan for my life. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave Jesus said that he came, why? So that we may have life and life more abundantly. He wants to get something to us. So in return, on this side of things, as a preacher and as a teacher, and I know as leaders here at the Becoming Church, that, that we lead from that perspective of knowing that we're not trying to get anything from you, but we're trying to get something to you. Can I get a good amen in the house today? That, that we don't leave with, lead with selfish ambition, but we lead with generosity, with a servant heart to get something to you. 
And here's the thing. We're going to look at Psalms 92 in just a few minutes. But, but before we look at that, I just want to say that, that God's word is powerful. I think we can, we can agree on that. That God's word is powerful. Like, but, but it's, it's only powerful when it's applied. So God's word applied in our lives is powerful and moving and breathing. And it's doing something great more than we could ever imagine. So when we look at Psalms 92, I believe that this is a passage in Scripture that if we apply this to our lives, then when we sing songs like, you are more than able, and who am I to deny what God can do, we can sing it as a testimony. We can sing it from an experience. We can sing it knowing that God truly is more than able, and I get to experience what God is doing. So the sad truth is that in our region, in the Bible Belt, in this part of the country, that people are always saying, you know, if you ask, you know, are you a Christian? People are like, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, yeah, I go to church. And, and that's exactly what they mean by that, is that I attend church. And then even that's open for definition of, okay, what does attending church look like in your life? Like, like is it a twice a year kind of a thing? Is it a, you know, one time a month kind of a thing? Is it just whenever I can kind of a thing? Like, like what does it mean to you to be a follower of Christ and to be a part of his church? Like, what does that mean? And that's what I want to focus on today, of what it means to be planted in the house of God. That church isn't just an event that we attend. That church isn't just something on our to-do list that we check off from time to time. That church isn't something that we're just obligated to do because we tag the name Christian alongside our title. But church is a people and it is a way of life for the believer that we are a part of the church and the church is embedded in our lives. So my challenge for you, to challenge number one for you today is, is to just get rid of the mentality of, yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I attend church. Yeah, I'm there whenever I can be. You know, fall, things could be busy. In wintertime, you got the holidays and you're kind of traveling here and there. In springtime, I kind of got my allergies, so I just, you know, just kind of make it when I can because of the sneezing and sniffling and all that kind of stuff. And summertime just is what it is. But my challenge to you today is to not just be a church attender, but to be planted in the house of God. Everybody say planted. My challenge is that we become planted and rooted in the house of God. This is what it says in Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. It says this, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like the cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright and he is my rock. Now, I love that imagery, and that's not a lot of, you know, terminology that we use in our everyday language of like, man, I'm just, flour how are you today? I'm flourishing. Like, like we, don't, we don't use that in our everyday language, but it is significant of, on what that means right here. To flourish means to be growing spiritually. That's what it's talking about in Psalms 92. It means to be growing spiritually. It means to be strong in our faith in such a way that positively affects our everyday lives. To be flourishing means to be strong in our faith, to be growing spiritually in such a way that it affects every single area of our life. And we say, well, how do we flourish? It says right there in Psalms 92 that those who are planted in the house of God will flourish. Everybody say flourish. Those who are planted in God's house will flourish. 
It says that the old will bear fruit. How many old people do I have in the room today? How many old people in the room? In the room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Bible says that you will be fresh and you will be green, always producing, always flourishing, no matter what season you are in in life. The Bible says that if you're breathing, then you are effective. If you are breathing, then you are being used by God. It doesn't matter if you're young. It doesn't matter if you're old. The Bible says if you're planted in the house of God, then that's going to affect every single area of your life, and you can be flourishing. Amen? We're always flourishing. We're always producing fruit in our life. Flourishing means to be succeeding. It means to be growing. It means to be thriving. It means to be prospering, to be increasing in the right direction. Now, I understand when I start using words like that, you know, you may kind of get a medium red flag of like, oh, prospering and, you know, and flourishing and succeeding. Like, like I don't want to get too prosperity gospel. We don't want to lean in that direction now, do we? Now, let, now, 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 let me tell you this. I want to ruffle just a couple of feathers. We're not too many in the room because I do care about what people think about me. That the gospel is good news. The gospel in and of itself is good news. And I understand that, that we can take it very far when we talk about success and talk about material things and stuff like that, but, but, but we don't have to take it that far because the gospel in and of itself is good news. The gospel is that Jesus came so that we may have life and have life more abundantly, so that's prosperity in and of itself, that my soul is saved and I'm anchored in my faith. The gospel in and of itself is good news. There is no poverty-ridden gospel. Come on now, somebody. There is no poverty-ridden gospel of I'm just barely holding on in this life until I see Jesus' sweet face. But no, God wants us to be blessed so that we can be a blessing to those around us. God wants to use us in what he's doing in the earth today. God wants our lives to be a living testimony of his goodness and of his grace and of his mercy. Now, I'll be honest with you, I really didn't, you know, plan on getting super, super excited, but this stuff is good. And I'm just saying, I just may preach a little bit today because I'm sharing good news. Somebody said, take your time, don't worry, I'm I'm not going to take too much time. There is no poverty-ridden gospel. The Bible says in John 10.10 10, that Satan, the thief, he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. His way of life takes from us. But he goes on to say that Jesus comes to give life and to give it more abundantly. So when we do life our own way and when we do life Satan's way, then things are being taken from us. But when we do life God's way, then he's getting something to us so that our lives can reflect his goodness, so that our lives can reflect his mercy and grace. God wants to bless us not so that we can have more stuff for ourselves, but so that our lives can be a living testimony of who he is. Can I get a good amen in the house today? And here's my encouragement to you. If you find yourself in a difficult place in life, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong. It just means that you need to lean in, that you need to keep pursuing God, that you need to keep investing in the house of God, that you need to keep leaning on other godly people in your godly community to depend on them for encouragement, to depend on them to learn something from them. We're all in this together. We learn together. We grow together. We move in the right direction together. There's two ways that we can live our life. It's God's plan or it's the devil's plan. Like I say, doing things my way. If I think I'm doing things my way, then that's not God's plan. That's, de that's the devil's plan. 
That's the way that he entices us to say that my way is better than God's way. That's his plan for our lives. But God's plan is always better. Psalms 92 says that those who are planted, those who are rooted, those who are grounded in the house of God flourish. But unfortunately, many people experience the very opposite of that. That instead of flourishing, we feel spiritually dry. Instead of thriving, we feel emotionally withering. Instead of being connected to God's people, we feel relationally isolated. Instead of prospering, we feel stressed. And instead of living a fulfilled life, we feel empty, always searching for something. And if you feel the negative side of what I just said, but I want to encourage you on how you can get to the other side. In Psalms 92, it mentions those two trees. It mentions the cedar tree and the palm tree. The cedar tree, we have a picture up here behind me. It represents durability, that the cedar wood was used in Solomon's palace as beams, as columns that held it together. The cedar tree is known for being a beautiful tree. It's known for having a pleasant aroma. And here's my question to you. Do you feel like your life is strong? Do you feel like your life is durable? Do you feel like you have an attractiveness to your life? Do you pull off a pleasant aroma to the people around you? These are the characteristics of being planted in the house of God. And then it mentions the palm branch, mentions the palm tree. And that's a symbol of triumph. It's a symbol of victory. The Romans awarded Olympic champions with palm branches. We saw where Jesus entered Jerusalem, what did they do? They threw palm branches before him. They waved palm branches around him as a symbol of triumph and victory. Are you living a triumphal life? Are you living a victorious life? These are the characteristics of being planted in the house of God. Both of those trees are evergreen trees. Everybody say evergreen. So that means that no matter what the season is, those trees are always green. Those trees are always alive. Those trees are always producing. That's what it means to be planted in the house of God. That no matter what the season is that you're going through, you're still producing. No matter what's happening around you, you still have a freshness about you. No matter what's happening in culture or in our country or in our workplace or in our family, you are still able to be a witness to the people around you because you're planted in the house of God. So my first point in talking about these trees is how is a tree planted? What's the basic starting place of a tree? It's a seed. It's a seed. And my encouragement to you is to see your life as a seed. To see your life as a seed. When you look at a seed, it's not very impressive. But a seed is extremely significant. Why? Because a seed holds potential. A seed holds expectation. A seed holds unseen value. A seed holds unseen life. Your life is a seed. Everybody say, my life is a seed. Your life is a seed. There are great things within just waiting to come out. Oh, that's a good place to clap your hands and give God praise. To know that there are great things inside of you just waiting to come out. If a seed stays unplanted, then it's only exposed and it holds little value. Unplanted seeds are also dormant, they're unfruitful, and they're unproductive. Unless you're eating them, like sunflower seeds which you don't want that to happen to you. The Bible talks about the farmer who, who 
threw seeds, and some of the seed fell on the ground, the uh, stony road. And what happened? The birds came and they devoured them. When you're not planted, then you're exposed. When you're not planted, then you're laying there dormant, just, just waiting for life to happen. And life begins to happen to you instead of you living on purpose. So my second point is that a seed only grows when it is planted. So if my life is a seed, then I can only grow if I am planted in the right place. Where do you find yourself planted? Some of us today need to take a real look at our lives, to take true evaluation and to know and to see that maybe the environment that we find ourselves in from day to day are not the right place for our seeds to be planted successfully and for our seeds to sprout and grow successfully. Do you find yourself in toxic relationships? Do you find yourself being around the wrong people? being in the wrong places. Take a look at your life and say, where am I planted? And you may say, well, I'm here today. Attending church once a week is not the same as being planted in the house of God. Going to church is not the same as being planted in the house of God. Going to church It's just going to church. Going to church is something that we can put on our to-do list and see it as an event. Just going to church is something that we can choose to prioritize or not. Going to church looks like I'll go if I'm not too busy. I'll go if I'm not too tired. I'll go if there's not a game on TV. Am I going to serve? Absolutely not. Am I going to invest? Absolutely not. But I'll just show up and watch and see what's happening. I'm here to encourage you today. Amen. Those who are planted in the house of God, they never ask the question, are we going to church? It's just a given answer that, of course, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be present. But not only am I going to be present, but I'm going to invest. I'm going to serve. I'm going to give. I'm going to tell people about what's happening at church. I'm going to be involved in small group. I'm going to be involved in the life of the church because it's not a person person's church. It is Jesus's church. It is his bride. Amen? That we cannot say we love Jesus but dismiss his bride. We cannot say we love Jesus but we don't want to be a part of his people. We can't say I love God but I isolate myself from his people. God's church isn't just a location but it is a part of our lives. His church is his people. My encouragement is to get planted in God's house. Some attend church and they experience God's presence like we did today and we enjoy it. But some people are planted in the house of God and we experience God's presence and we are changed forever. Some go to church when they can, but some are planted in the house of God and it has an effect in every single area of their lives. Some will attend church and then look back over the years and still not be involved and their lives still be spiritually shaky. Some are planted in, house, in God's house and their lives are forever changed. That they see their lives stronger no matter what's happening around them. That they're connected in godly community. That they're living in God's blessing. And life isn't perfect, but we have hope because our faith is strong. Because our hope is in the right place. And because we have a love from God and from his people that sustain us. Somebody say planted. 
that we want to be planted in God's house, that we want to experience victory, that we want to experience joy that we want to have a passion that goes beyond ourselves, that we want to have peace, that we want to have purpose, that we want our marriages to be thriving, that we want to be successful in every single aspect of our life because we're planted in God's house. When you're planted in God's house, you understand that church isn't just a place. It's not just a destination. It's not just a building or a school, but church is the gathering of God's people. That God, that we go all in with God's house. That we dive completely in and we see our lives changed. I believe that the Becoming Church is a wonderful church. Anybody believe that here today? Somebody clap your hands if you believe that this is a good house. This is a good place to be planted. That you have leaders who want the best for you. That you have leaders who preach the truth, that preach the word of God, that give you hope, and that tell you how your life can be in the right direction according to God's word. There's this strange phenomenon, and there's this, there's this strange idea that the enemy tries to plant in our minds. That somehow, some way, being planted and being involved in church is going to somehow mess up your life. Or that somehow, if you're going through a tough season, then you need to pull back from being involved in the house of God. I want to encourage you and just take no part in that idea. That the Bible says that we take our thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. So take that thought captive and know that if I'm going through a tough season in life, then I need to dive more into the house of God. I need to be around people who are going to increase my faith. I need to be hearing an encouraging word from God. I don't need to back up, but I need to lean in. That church doesn't mess up my life, church doesn't take away from me, but it is God's way and God's plan to get something to me. Your life is a seed, and in order to grow, then it has to be planted. So what happens when I'm planted? Number one, your roots grow deep. When you're planted in God's house, then your roots grow deep. Deep. In Jeremiah 17, verse 8, it says this. They, talking about us, are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat. They are not worried by long months of drought. That's how we want to be. Has anybody ever been to California where the Redwood National Park is? Have you ever been there? Awesome. My goal is to get there in, within the next 12 months. They have these massive trees. I think I may have a picture up here. Yeah. They have these massive trees, and they're the largest living thing on the face of the earth. They say that these trees are over, they're, they're larger, they're taller than a 30-story building, and they're wider than a three-story building. And they tell us that these trees, they're held together by each other because their roots grow lateral up to 100 to 150 feet out. They grow lateral from their trunk, and the roots from each tree are intertwined between the trees. So they're literally holding each other up because their roots are intertwined. So when the wind blows and when storms come, they stay standing because they're holding each other up. That's what it means to be planted in the house of God, to know that you're not doing life alone, but you have fellow believers around you. So no matter what's happening in your life, you can lock arms with the men and women of God around you and stand strong because you might need to borrow faith from someone else. You may need someone to say, you can do it. Don't give up. You may need someone to say, just keep going. I know this is hard. I know this is unfair. I know it's difficult, but keep standing strong in your faith. That we hold 
each other up. That we need each other. We consistently face opposition. We consistently face trials in life. We are consistently facing doubts and struggles and people that come our way. But we can continue to stand strong when we're planted in God's house because we know we're not standing alone. When we connect with the people of God in a faith-filled environment, it's like a breath of fresh air. When we're connected to godly community, it increases our faith because we know that we're not alone. When we serve alongside each other, when we learn from each other, when we give and sacrifice together, we increase our faith together. The devil wants to isolate us, but God wants us in godly community. I believe you have a small group semester coming up soon. What an opportunity to be involved with godly community just in the simple context of small group. Sunday after Sunday, we all have the opportunity to serve together and to be a part of building God's house brick by brick. What a great opportunity to be planted in God's house and to be a part of community. So what happens when we're planted in God's house, my next point, is our roots produce fruit. My roots produce fruit. Everybody say fruit. How many of y'all love some good fruit? Like an orange, an apple, you know, some grapes, whatever it is. My roots produce fruit. So Jeremiah 17, 8, it goes on and it says that my roots, with roots that reach deep into the water, such trees are not bothered by the heat and they're not worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Another lie that the devil wants to tell us is that when life gets hard, when things get hectic, is when we need to step back from God's church. But that's when we have to immerse ourselves with the people of God and get planted more deeply in God's house because trials are going to come. Drought is going to happen. All of these things, life is just going to life. Amen? But the Bible tells us that we're not bothered and we're not shaken through these different seasons and through these different experiences because we will still produce fruit when we're rooted and grounded in God's house. What does that fruit look like in my life? This is what it says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 20. This is the fruit of God's Holy Spirit, that it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's forbearance, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the fruit that it's talking about being produced in our lives when we're planted in the house of God. How many of us can use some more of that in our lives? Some more love, some more joy, some more peace, some more patience, all of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We can all use more of that in our lives. And the way that that is produced is by being planted in God's house. That's fruit. That fruit's awesome. But my fruit is not for me. My fruit is for the people around me. It's a love that overflows. It's a joy that spreads. It's a peace from God that is attractive. It's having kindness that blesses the people around us. It's having faithfulness that strengthens the relationships in my life. This is what it means to be planted in God's house. It's continually discovering the thrill of being used by God, to be used by God. We're not just saved from our sin, but we're also saved by Jesus for the glory of God. Amen? That we're saved to be a blessing to the people around us. My encouragement is to get planted because life 
is going to happen. Life happens, but be present. Be planted. Be faithful to your godly community. Be invested in the house of God. Serve in the house of God. Be in the house of God. Invite others to be a part of the house of God. Get planted here at the Becoming Church. This is an amazing place. God is on the move here. Amen? He's opening doors of opportunity here. People are getting saved. There's fresh vision here. This is a church that's hungry to reach our community hungry to be moving forward at all time, hungry for the presence of God, hungry to always be getting better. This is a safe place to get planted. Is it a perfect place? No, but it's God's house. And we're just a part of what God's doing in the world today. Get planted in the house of God. How can we expect to defeat the powers of darkness just by attending church when we can? We have to lean in and get planted in the house, and it takes time. Many of us will say, well, I tried it and it didn't work. When you plant an acorn in the ground, when do you see a massive oak tree? There's seed and there's time, 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 and then there's harvest. <laughs> like, it takes time. There's seed, time, and then there is harvest. We don't just show up and then give up, but we show up and we keep showing up and we get involved, and we get invested in the house of God, and that time and that faithfulness is there. And then before we know it, we look back and we say, look at what the Lord has done in my life. Look at what God has done in my life. God, you are more than able. Trees don't grow overnight. You may say, well, my goodness, the church is just full of hypocrites. How can I be a part of that? Welcome to the club. We can always use one more. None of us are perfect. Amen? We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But guess what? We get back up, and we get back up together. You know that it's easier to get back up when you have a teammate that's grabbing your hand and helping you up? and not look at you fall and say, look at him, he fell. Look at her, she fell. Look at her, she messed up. But to have people around you that say, oh my gosh, are you okay? Let me help you. So what does a seed need in order to grow and to flourish? It needs the right kind of soil. And that's gonna be the condition of your heart. A seed needs light. And that's God's word. The Bible says that God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A seed needs water. What's the water? That's, that's Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he is the living water that quenches all thirst. We need the right kind of temperature. Amen? I'm warm right now. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit. Since I'm hot right now, we can talk about fire right now. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit that provides the right kind of temperature for the seed to grow and to be successful. And then this is our favorite one. We need time. Time. We need patience. That there's seed, time, and harvest. And the best day to get planted is always today. It's not, oh, when my life gets easier. It's not when my schedule comes down. It's not when my kids grow up. It's not when I get this promotion and I get through this season. No, the best time to get planted in the house of God is today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't let this day pass you by. Amen? Make a decision today to get planted in God's house. And in order to get planted in God's house, you have to get planted in Christ. So today, if you're here today and you're like, oh, that sounds awesome and that sounds like a 
really great plan, and maybe it's something that I need in my life, but I don't even know who Jesus is. If that's you here today, then I want to pray with you. I want to let you know that Jesus is the best thing that could ever happen to you. He is the only way. He is the truth, and he is the life. He is the light of our salvation.